I watch they, TV. I've seen the news. I know that that the Affordable Health Care Act is going to fix all of this. That's it. We're done. Right, Patrick? It's not going to fix everything, but it may make some things better. I'd like to, just, uh, to comment on something you said. I think that you know those those data regarding what patients are experiencing when they're actually using a product, let's say for home use, which really is the, the standard, I'd say, for management of, of hemophilia in 2013. Um, you know, we just want to make sure that those metrics don't become too burdensome for patients or uh, you know, physicians because they probably, you know, won't get done. Um, you know, I think a concern in hemophilia is the high cost of the drug. Um, you mentioned hemophilias, hemophilia with inhibitors before, uh, Maria, and you mentioned a, a high cost. You know, it may uh, cost a million dollars a year to manage bleeds just in a responsive fashion to a patient with hemophilia and an inhibitor. Um, you know, when you are looking at an insurance policy that has a lifetime cap, you can imagine that with severe hemophilia or an inhibitor, you, you get there pretty fast. Um, in addition, you know, I think transition to um, the adult center from the pediatric center is a vulnerable, vulnerable time in hemophilia. And that's exactly when we want to make sure there aren't insurance lapses. Um, and so that healthcare reform may provide for um, you know, younger adults with hemophilia being able to stay on their parents' insurance for a longer guaranteed time, elimination of pre-existing conditions, um, limitation perhaps on caps or a management of caps in a, in a better way that so the state takes on some of the burden or the, the even the federal government if the state decides to organize its you know health care uh, consortium that way those things we we hope will result in better you know access for patients you know we don't even have time to go into some of the the real nitty-gritty legislative kind of things you know the wonky mm -hmm. stuff uh, insurance coverage uh, billing payment reimbursement structures uh, cost containment strategies, you've alluded to some of them. Patient advocacy is always in there, there's financial incentives. Mm -hmm. What's driving research? This is all stuff that's got to be threshed out going forward, right? But what I really want to do right now is give everybody the last word. One last opportunity to talk to the camera, talk to our viewers, and tell us what you think is the most important thing in 30 seconds or less. Patrick, you're up first. Sure. Well, um, I think this has been a great discussion and it highlights the complexities of delivering excellent care to patients with congenital bleeding disorders. What I think we all want to see you know, on this panel and elsewhere is that patients who have hemophilia receive the drugs that they need to stay healthy and have access to the care at specialty hemophilia treatment centers. Okay, Hugh, you're up. Well, again, this has been a great discussion. Um, what I like to say definitely is to pharmaceutical companies, we do need more price transparency in the way that uh, drugs uh, that are approved under the orphan status are priced, uh, so that on the payer side, we are ensuring that uh, the cost is also commensurate with the value that has been provided at the incremental clinical value that has been provided by the drug. Maria. Uh, I'll echo. It's uh, been a great discussion, a great panel, and I always learn from the specialists in and the field. And we're still friends. Yes, we are. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, I think uh, the concept of what is a best practice, you know, we, we have in the U.S. an untenable situation, which is affordability of health care, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to work together on um, best practices, uh, hopefully that define who is deriving the best value out of these high-cost therapies and how we can minimize uh, waste um, and to the extent that adherence improves better outcomes, how we can work collectively on a solution. Michelle, you've got the last word. Good. I knew you'd say that. I'm not surprised that lupus is finally on the radar screen for managed care. This is overdue. What we're facing in lupus is that in the last couple of decades, there's been no improvement in the incidence of end-stage renal disease. Since 1980, there's been no improvement in survival. I think in the lupus field, we thank God that finally biologics are being developed for lupus because we need new strategies. And I think you've heard me very clearly in the program stating that we still have to individualize for lupus. It's still at the patient level. All right, well, I want to thank all of you. This has been actually a great discussion. Uh, and nobody was physically harmed. <laughs> and everybody is smiling at the end. But that is all the time that we have here today. On behalf of me, Dr. Peter Salgo, and AJMC TV, Peer Exchange, I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank you for watching. Until next time.